So today we're going to be talking about MEG, magnetoencephalography, and source localization, which is closely related to MEG. Also applies to EEG. We'll talk about that when we get there. Yeah. So this is what an MEG machine looks like, uh, kind of like a big futuristic hair dryer. And the reason that it looks like this, there we go, is inside there where you see her head, we call that the helmet. So it's a hard plastic surface. Inside that are embedded a bunch of sensors. And those sensors are then held in a dewer of liquid helium. And that's uh, liquid helium is super cool down close to absolute zero. And that's necessary for the sensors, which have to be superconducting in order to be able to detect the tiny magnetic fields uh, that are present in MEG. In this particular model, so this is made by a company called Electa, who are um, a major medical device company, and it's the most prevalent uh, producer of MEG systems. There's another company, CTF, who were a Canadian company and then got bought out by a Chinese company and kind of didn't make machines for a while, and then they do again. But it's, it's a relatively small market. It's used primarily in research work. There's some clinical applications for MEG in epilepsy, primarily and sometimes in pre-surgical mapping and other things. But whereas MRI has a huge range of clinical applications and a sort of standard of care for a lot of clinical conditions for diagnosis, MEG is not. And so where it's being used often, it's, uh, there are difficulties using it clinically around how do you even bill for it and what's the value of it. So whereas MRIs are present in like every hospital in the developed world, that's an exaggeration, but they're, they're widely, widely prevalent, MEG systems are not, so there's only a handful in Canada. Uh, so there's like Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, and I'm not sure if there's any between Toronto and Vancouver, actually. And generally speaking, they're research-dedicated machines that maybe get a bit of clinical use, so they're not, they're not heavily uh, clinically used. And where that's really relevant is from a research perspective, although MEG is a, a relatively mature technique, it doesn't have nearly kind of the install base or the number of people who are using MEG for research as with MRI. And because of the need for liquid helium, that drives the price up and just the, the whole system is, is quite expensive. So they're, you know, ballpark one to two million dollars to buy an MEG machine and then one to two million dollars extra to shield it from external magnetic fields and then the cost of liquid helium. So doing an MEG scan costs kind of comparable to an MRI scan and then the data aren't for reasons we'll talk about, there are some advantages, but also some disadvantages to MEG versus fMRI. So a lot more people, if they're going to spend the money, would use it uh, on fMRI rather than on MEG. It's still a cool technique. Another feature I'll point out about this one is that this whole thing actually tips. So you can see the woman here is sitting uh, in the scanner, which is a very natural way, obviously, to do it. But the whole thing will tip so that you can lie in the scanner. So if you're doing studies of sleep or studies of infants or, or things like that, you can actually tip it and use it in the prone position, which is kind of cool because that's one of the downsides of MRI is that whatever you do, you have to be lying in this tube. So it's sort of a, an uncomfortable for some people and fairly artificial kind of situation. All right. Uh, actually, just stepping back there, uh, this also makes it very kid-friendly. And in fact, our MEG system is at the IWK, uh, the pediatric hospital. And it's kid-friendly both because it, you, your head isn't uh, covered, right? So you can sort of see the world around you. You're a little less constrained for movement. Uh, MRI makes very loud noises, whereas MEG is silent. So there's some real advantages for, for working with kids. The way MEG works is it's measuring essentially the same brain activity that EEG measures. So changes in postsynaptic potentials and the electrical currents that are created in the brain because of that. The difference is that uh, MEG is based on the principle of the right-hand rule or Ampere's circuital law. I still have trouble saying circuital. Um, and uh, so this is basically saying whenever you have an electrical current flowing, you have a magnetic field generated around it. So what we're measuring with MEG is that magnetic component of the electrical activity of the brain. So the brain's generating these uh, magnetic fields. They're very tiny. The analogy that's used is like you're listening for the footsteps of an ant at a rock concert. So very, very tiny fluctuations in the magnetic fields compared to the magnetic interference, electromagnetic interference that's coming from overhead lights, any electrical equipment. Uh, and in the case of MEG, you can pick up with these super sensitive sensors magnetic fields from quite a far distance. Uh, 
So elevators nearby can cause problems. There's a classic story of one that was installed in Boston too close to the subway line, and they actually put it in underground, thinking, oh, then it's going to be really well shielded because there's nothing underground, not thinking where the subway line was. And every time a subway went by, it produced huge artifacts. So they could actually only run the scanner, apparently, in like the wee hours between you know 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. or whenever the subway wasn't running. Live and learn. Nowadays, there, as I'll come to talk about, there are uh, advanced methods for shielding, so that's less of an issue, but it's still still an issue, and certainly the just the need to shield uh, becomes a, a significant issue. Another thing to point out is, you know, again, if you think back to EEG, it's open field configurations of neurons that generate measurable EEG at the scalp. So that's neurons where they're all nicely aligned, you know, so anatomically they're parallel to each other. And they've got coherent input coming in that means that across neurons, their postsynaptic potentials are, are quite synchronized. With MEG, because of this right-hand rule, there are some orientations of neurons that will generate measurable magnetic fields outside the head, and other ones where the magnetic field ends up being contained entirely inside the head, in which case you can't measure it with MEG. And so that's what you're seeing in the bottom here, where the blue is the electrical current, the black is the magnetic field being generated around it. So for all these neurons that are sort of nicely parallel to the, I guess perpendicular to the surface of the cortex, their magnetic field stays entirely inside the head. This is maybe a little limited because, of course, the head is curved. So maybe far out to one side or the other, you would actually see a, a weak magnetic field, um, but it would be relatively weak. Whereas here, where the neurons are aligned on the bank of the sulcus, now that magnetic field actually will come out of the head and back in. And so that one you'll be able to detect with MEG. Another way of visualizing this, uh, again, thinking about the right-hand rule, is over on the left, you've got the electrical potential. And you can see that uh, the, the dipoles sort of oriented in an entirely implausible location in the middle of the head uh, between the two hemispheres, but just for the sake of argument. So you've got the dipole pointed toward the front of the head. And so the positive end shown in red is going to be the entire front of the head is going to show a positive electrical potential on EEG. Behind is going to show a negative potential because of the orientation of the dipole. But with that, if I superimpose my hand over that arrow with MEG, magnetic fields actually coming out on the left side of the head and then going back in on the right side of the head. So red is a magnetic field coming out, blue is magnetic field going back in. So the fields are, are directly perpendicular to each other. Of course, in the real case where you've got multiple different brain areas active at once and overlap from generators and everything sort of propagating out, the situation is going to be a little less clean cut than this. Uh, so it's not always the case that if you see a, an EEG configuration uh, of where the positive and negative potentials are, the MEG one is going to be exactly 90 degrees to that. But there is underlying this fundamental relationship uh, between the two. Another interesting thing with MEG, which is actually one of its big strengths in terms of its ability to localize where things are coming from, is that where electrical signals volume conduct through wet things like the brain, magnetic fields uh, are just sort of conducted. They're not conducted in the same way. They travel through space, but they're, they're not dependent on uh, the wet medium of the brain. And in fact, magnetic fields drop off sharply uh, with the square root uh, of the distance. So. Whereas with EEG, the fact that we see a big potential over a particular electrode doesn't tell us anything about where in the brain it's coming from. With MEG, if we see a big change in magnetic field under a particular sensor, that we can be pretty confident that the change is occurring quite close to that sensor, um, with, with some caveats that I'll talk about in the next slide. But in general, because the, the magnetic fields drop off so sharply with distance, the, uh, they're quite local, and so you get sort of improved spatial resolution even at the sensor level, and definitely in your ability to resolve where these things are coming from, come to, and we'll get to, to the source localization part. Now, you might perceive kind of a, a conflict there because I'm saying that the brain signals drop off very sharply with distance, but at the same time, MEG is sensitive to like an elevator in some other room at the hospital or a subway underground. And the difference is that, again, the MEG signals from the brain are little footsteps of an ant at a rock concert. And that elevator, that's you know the bass guitar or, or something in the rock concert or the drummer. So they're just that much bigger magnetic field. So they still will drop off 
with distance, but they're so big to begin with that they, they carry over much larger distances and cause interference with energy. And even local things, so like um, breathing isn't per se a problem with MEG, but if you breathe in and you have metal buttons or an underwire bra or like the button or belt, uh, all of those things just are metal moving through space. And metal moving through space causes distortions in electromagnetic fields. And that's enough metal in something like a button even that it'll cause something that gets picked up by the MEG. So again, it's just that the brain signals are so really tiny, the miracle is actually that we can measure them at all in the context of all this background noise. So, so MEG sensitivity drops off quite sharply with depth. And what this image is showing is basically how strong a signal would have to be in order for it to be recorded at these MEG sensors outside the scalp. And you can see that, uh, so, so red means the most intense source. So to be able to detect anything in the, the midbrain, basal ganglia, even the hippocampus, you'd need a signal that's three or four times larger than the signal uh, at the cortex in order for it to be the same size at, at the MEG sensor. So it's not entirely the case that MEG is only sensitive to the areas uh, around the sensor, but it's much disproportionately more sensitive to those than to deeper sources, which means that, again, the source localization is easier, the problem's not entirely solved, um, but it, it, it's certainly much better and there is some evidence that you can pick up deep sources. So this is one study, um, I lost the, the citation for it, um, but it was done in Finland, and they were looking at the auditory brainstem response. So with EEG, this is a routine test that's done by audiologists uh, in a lot of places, including Nova Scotia. Every child who's born uh, gets an audio, uh, auditory brain response screening before they leave the hospital. And it basically involves sticking an electrode over the top of the head, and, and you're referencing ground electrodes as well, and playing a whole series of very short click sounds uh, to a person, baby or adult. And those sounds, the brainstem responds to obligatorily. So the baby doesn't have to be conscious, awake, you know, doing anything in particular. And again, you can do this with adults as well. But uh, the cool thing about it is that, and this is just the MEG one, but with EEG, you get a whole series of peaks in the first 10 milliseconds after a stimulus. So it's, it's super high resolution even compared to typical ERPs. Uh, and those peaks correspond to each synaptic junction in the auditory pathway from the cochlea all the way up to the cortex. And so from an auditory diagnostic perspective, it's very powerful because you've got a baby who's newly born. They can't tell you if they can hear your voice or not, but you can tell if they're deaf. And moreover, you can tell if they are deaf what stage, you know, where that deafness is coming from. Is it peripheral, so you're only seeing like the, the first peak in this brain response and not the later peaks? Or is it more central, where you're seeing a whole series of peaks but not the cortical peaks? Uh, so very valuable, but these things are all coming from the brainstem. And in this study, they were able to show that they were able to get those uh, effects using MEG. And they've localized different peaks in their waveform to these different spots here. Mm -hmm. So again, you can sort of see going from the more peripheral ones uh, to uh, crossing the brainstem into the pons and then higher order nuclei. And all in the course of, you know, just the, the longest latency here is 5.7 milliseconds, so very fast. So these are very deep sources. MEG can pick them up. The, the catch there is that there were about, uh, I think, uh, sort of 16,000 trials. Uh, per subject. So that's a lot of stimuli, and far more stimuli than we would normally be able to present in any sort of cognitive neuroscience experiment. It's feasible here because the clicks are so brief that you can pack a whole bunch of them in in a short period of time. So in practice, that means that if you have a normal cognitive neuroscience experiment with maybe 30 or 50 stimuli in each condition, you probably don't have enough power in terms of your signal averaging and so on to see those deep sources. And regardless, the signal is going to be dominated by the more peripheral um, cortical sources rather than those deep sources. So it's going to be hard to see them. So it's, it's not true that MEG is only sensitive to cortical sources, but it's primarily uh, quite heavily sensitive to those. So yeah, the technical challenge of MEG, as I said, is that you're looking for signals that are on the order of 10 to the negative 15th Tesla, Tesla being magnetic field strength measure. Uh, so that's in the femtotesla range. Uh, so that's orders of magnitude smaller than the Earth's magnetic field that pulls the needle of a compass around, and even more orders of magnitude smaller than like a simple fridge magnet or something like that. Uh, 
for reference, an MRI system would be like 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, um, newer ones are even 7 Tesla. Uh, so those are massively, massively powerful uh, magnetic fields um, for reference, whereas what your brain is generating is, is teeny, teeny tiny. All right. So sources of noise, uh, we have external sources, so I've already talked about uh, that. Um, and I'll talk about how to mitigate them in, in a sec. Equipment in the room, so you know, if you're presenting stimuli, you need some sort of visual presentation, auditory presentation, response devices for them to press buttons on. With EEG, we worry a little bit about the electrical signals, but they're mostly 60 hertz noise. They're very well characterized, and it's pretty easy to filter them out. With MEG, the sources of noise can be more complex and much harder to, to take out. And because, again, we're measuring these super tiny signals, we, we try and go to great lengths to minimize any electromagnetic interference. So in an MEG system, you're already in a shielded room. I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, the projector, uh, so for visual presentation, you don't have a monitor or anything in the room. Instead, you have a tube, a hole in the wall with a tube called a waveguide. And waveguides are a special kind of device. It's, I mean, it's special, but it's not. It's just a tube. But the ratio of the diameter of that tube relative to its length, so they're very long compared to their diameter, and that prevents uh, external magnetic fields from being able to go through that. So it's sort of a, a physical kind of filter. So what you do is you have a projector like the one we have here with a special lens that makes it more focal, have that outside of the room shoot through the waveguide, and then you just have a passive screen on the inside that people can see the stimuli on. Uh, for auditory presentation, there's a couple of options. The one that's usually used is they'll have a, a, a speaker in the room, but as far away from the subject as possible. And they're specially designed speakers that are well shielded, so they produce minimal electromagnetic interference. There are also some headphones that you can get that have very long tubes. So the, the speaker of a headphone typically has a piezoelectric thing in it that generates its own little magnetic field. So you don't want that anywhere near somebody's head. But what you can do is have those far away and have these tubes basically that run from the speaker to the, the ear and just little foam earplugs that plug into the ear and that can present the sound without having the electronics close to the subject. And then for response boxes they typically use a fiber optic response box. So this is as it sounds it's using light rather than electricity uh, to detect the button presses and convey those to systems outside the room so it keeps the noise out. Subject sources of noise include um, uh, respiratory, I mentioned sort of breathing, and again, it's not the breathing itself, but breathing, moving bits of metal, like buttons and so on, through the air. Uh, heart, uh, heart can actually be picked up uh, more with MEG than EEG, typically, so you see these little cardiac spikes in your MEG data. Muscle artifact is a relatively minor thing. Um, we're more concerned, actually, with the movement of the head than, than muscles in most situations. Um, and, and the difference there is that with EEG, we've got these sensors stuck to the head, and the muscles are very close to those, and they, they propagate well, whereas the brain signal is inside the skull and gets much more attenuated. With MEG, we're, um, we're not as sensitive because everything, again, is, is fairly localized. And then any metal in the head or the body or the clothes uh, can be a big problem. So when you go in for an MEG scan, you have to, like, if you've got earrings, glasses, all that stuff has to come off. Um, dental work can sometimes be a problem, like wires and, and fillings and that sort of thing. And uh, anything like if somebody's wearing an underbrier bra, we tell them to wear a sports bra or something like that. So you have to mitigate these things. Yeah. Uh, when I was reading about this, you were talking about tattoos. Yeah. So I was just wondering, does having tattoos exclude you from doing this, or do you need control for them? Or how do you... it, it doesn't exclude you. Tattoos can be a problem. Less, it's more of a concern with MRI for various reasons. When we get to MRI, we can talk about that. Some of the dyes in tattoos have metallic flakes in them, and so they are metal. And so again, if, if that's moving through space, it can cause some distortions in the magnetic field. Now, the amount of metal that's in a tattoo compared to like an earring is pretty minimal. And by and large, people don't have a lot of tattoos on their faces or around the sensors. So having that tattoo like on your arm or something, even though it's moving through space, is probably um, less of a concern. So, I wouldn't exclude somebody a priori just because they said they had a tattoo. It'd be more bring them in and you know be aware of that. And if it does look like there's a problem, then you might not be able to run the person. But in general, they're far less of an issue than, than with MRI. 
and even with MRI, they're not an exclusion. Uh, they're just a consideration. Yeah. Okay, so subject sources, and uh, then the MEG system itself. Uh, we uh, so so coming back to how do we attenuate that first one? Radiometers and stuff. I'll talk about the radiometers in a minute. And uh, more generally, uh, we have sensors on and around the MEG system that are picking up the ambient electrical uh, magnetic fields and subtracting those out from the signal. So basically, anything that hits both those external sensors and the ones close to the head, uh, it's going to generate a similar signal in both, and that'll cancel out. Where it's sort of the same principle as the differential amplifiers in EEG, where you have the active and and ground and reference electrodes so that you're able to measure sort of the constant electrical background noise and, and remove that. Principle's the same here. With, with shielding, there's actually two ways of shielding MEG, and most systems nowadays use a combination of the two. The old way was just using passive shielding, and uh, this involved uh, mu metal. So for electromagnetic interference or electrical interference, like RF, uh, with the EEG booth, I talked about Faraday cages, which is basically just a, a copper cage that's grounded. Those are relatively cheap uh, to make. MEG requires not just copper, but something called mu metal, which is a mixture of like aluminum and nickel and some other stuff, molybdenum, which I like to say. And it doesn't actually com completely remove the magnetic fields from entering the room, but it basically causes them to bend and sort of channels them around the room, which is what you're seeing in the bottom right here. Is these, these fields sort of hit and, and bend around. So the effect is that around the edges of the room, you might still have some interference, but it largely keeps it out of the center of the room where the scanner actually is. Uh, here you can see a picture of one. Often they, people go to great lengths to try and isolate, uh, especially if they're just relying on the passive shielding, to try and isolate the MEG system from other things. So I mentioned burying it underground. Uh, one that I went to in Helsinki, it's a building, it's like attached to the main university building, but it's an outbuilding. So mostly on most sides, it's there's not anything close by. And it's also got uh, very thick concrete uh, as well as the new metal. And these rooms are quite big, quite expensive to build. They're very heavy, so you can't typically put them on anything other than the ground floor and like a, a concrete slab. Uh, so it's, it's, the siting is, is fairly complicated. Nowadays, they have this active shielding which relies on using some mu metal, but less mu metal and less sort of mass, which makes it possible to have them on upper floors and, and this sort of thing. And they have these antennae basically around the room that are picking up all the external magnetic fields. And again, subtracting that out from the data that's being recorded from the mag sensors around the person's head. And so any, again, anything that's similar across the two is gonna get canceled out. So it's a way of actively removing the noise rather than keeping it from getting in into the room in the first place. And I mentioned the liquid cooling already. You can see the inside guts of the MEG schematically here. So you've got uh, the, the big thing is like the helmet is down here and then where it says cables and all that, all the gray stuff is basically the liquid helium that everything's bathed in so that whole thing is kept super cool. This is as I said, one of the big problems with MEG is that it requires liquid helium. Liquid helium is a scarce resource uh, worldwide. It's a byproduct of, of mining industry, but it's it's uh, more scarce than like even oil or, or something like that. So it's an ongoing problem that uh, MEG systems, including ours, have had periods where it's been hard, if not impossible, to even get the liquid helium, and so they'll have to like shut down the facility for a certain amount of time. MRI also uses liquid helium, but uh, within MRI systems and some MEG systems, it's a closed system, meaning the, the stuff evaporates because you're trying to keep it super cool and it inevitably warms up a bit. And the recovery system, the closed systems basically sort of catch that vaporized uh, helium and condense it back down. So it's sort of you know keeping everything internal and, and recycled. Whereas the conventional design for an MEG system, it's an open system. So that helium is constantly uh, bubbling off, and then you have to keep replacing it. Uh, so it's uh, fairly high ongoing costs there. And and the reason for that is just that it's another expense. It's like, you know, a hundreds of thousands of dollars kind of thing to get that recycling system. And so it's not built into the, the cost of the, the systems by default. Uh, 
So that's the conventional system. There's this new system, and this was just published in Nature like a year ago. It looks freaky, uh, but it's a wearable MEG system. And so in this system, rather than relying on the sensors that I'll talk about in a minute that are requiring supercooling, superconductivity, it's using a, a completely different technology that involves uh, um, an element called rubidium here and a laser beam. And basically, when you shine the laser beam on uh, these rubidium atoms, they line up with the laser beam. And then if a magnetic field impinges on them, like the magnetic field from your head, it causes the, uh, the atoms to sort of bend and move out of line with the laser beam. And that affects the amount of transmission of, of the laser, uh, which you can measure. And so it, it's a different way of measuring the magnetic fields that has its own complexities, but doesn't require on supercooling and liquid helium in this massive doer, which means that it is wearable, um, as you can see here. Uh, so that's a, a system with just a few sensors attached to the head. This freaky looking thing is a 3D printed mask that's customized to that the shape of the person's head so it stays uh, quite securely in place. Because you can imagine these, you, you couldn't just attach those to like an EEG cap because they're going to be so heavy they're just going to pull off. Now, it's wearable, but it's not portable. So it's still detecting super tiny magnetic fields in the context of the rock concert. And so you still have to do it in the shielded room and worry about all those uh, other kinds of considerations. But it has a lot of potential because it, it's a little more flexible in uh, a couple of ways and doesn't depend on liquid helium. So from a sort of long-term sustainability perspective, it, it certainly um, got a lot of promise there and more cost effective. The other thing that I didn't really allude to yet is that because the MEG system, the conventional ones are a helmet, it's not a customized tight fitting helmet. So with EEG, we've got these stretchy Lycra caps and we've got different size caps for different size heads and the electrodes all sort of stick close to the head. With MEG, you're basically in this hard plastic shell and you can move your head around and the shell's designed to be big enough to fit sort of the biggest feasible human head. And so if you have a smaller head, especially kids, you're gonna have a fair amount of space from the sensors to the head and potentially variable space between the sensor and the head both like if you're sitting with your head against the back of the helmet then the frontal sensors are going to be farther away from your head and again because these fields drop off so sharply with distance that means that you actually have less sensitivity to brain activity in people with smaller heads children and potentially differential sensitivity to different brain areas depending on how their head's positioned in there and then there's additional complexity that that also means that people are free to move their head within the scanner we tell them not to we have ways as i mentioned in a minute that uh, you can track the head movement but it's not perfect. And what that means in practice is that with EEG, sensors are stuck to the head. So that means like, you know, if I see something and it's coming out of electrode F3, F4, that's the right side of my head, F4 say, uh, I know where on the head that came from, right? And that's gonna be proportionally the same in any individual that I put that cap on. With MEG, that sensor is somewhere relative to the head, but the head can move. And so what that sensor is picking up in the brain is actually potentially different from time point to time point, uh, which makes things a lot more complicated. It's actually part of why people rely on source localization a lot more with MEG, because the sensor stuff is actually a little messier and less consistent across individuals. Uh, so anyway, having the wearable MEG where the things are actually affixed to the head gives you big advantages in terms of that sensor placement and you're actually less sensitive to head motion in principle, things like that. So again, a lot of promise, but like I say, this was published in Nature, so this isn't like a commercial system that anybody can buy. This is a one-off system that has taken a lot of time and resources and effort to get one up and running and show basic proof of concept. So we're still likely years, if not decades out from that being a used technology. Okay, so with conventional MEG, supercooling, we use these devices called SQUIDs, or superconducting quantum interference devices. And these, and, and there were, I think, at least two Nobel Prizes associated with development of MEG, including for the, the, the SQUIDs and the, the Josephson junctions within them. Uh, so with a SQUID, you've got a detector coil, and remember, this is all inside the, the MEG helmet. You've got a detector coil, which is essentially a loop of conductive wire close to the head, so that's going to pick up your electrical, electromagnetic field via the right-hand rule. So right-hand rule comes into play both in generating that magnetic field 
I mean, out of the brain, but then also it's working to induce the current in the sensor because the sensor is a metal wire, so it's a conductor. So as the magnetic field touches it, it's going to induce an electrical current in that wire. And that goes a short distance uh, through what's called a flux transformer, essentially a conductor, to what we call the input coil, which is a winding of uh, multiple loops of that coil. And the winding basically serves to amplify the signal. Because if you imagine that the, the conductor, through the right-hand rule, can, creates a magnetic field, if you have lots of loops of that conductor all carrying that, that's going to sort of summate and give you a, a stronger magnetic field. So here you've got uh, the induced magnetic field shown with the, the, the blue arrows there uh, from that wire. And then the Josephson junction is sitting next to that. And it's so the magnetic field is influencing the Josephs. That word is really hard to say. Josephson junction. Um, and the, 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 so the squid is the whole thing. The Josephson junctions are those little dark squares in there. And they have a specific property about how they conduct uh, um, current uh, in such a way that they're very sensitive to magnetic fields. And so you, you basically pass a weak current called the bias current through that system. And as the magnetic field hits it, the amount of current that's flowing through changes proportionate to the magnetic field. And that gets carried away uh, as the mode signal. And so it's a, it's a fairly complex system and relies on the superconductor of the Josephson junctions, um, but at the end of the day, the basic principles are all around the right-hand rule and just using sort of a combination of magnetic fields inducing currents and currents inducing magnetic fields um, to measure the flux in the magnetic signal. And that's critical is that what we're measuring is this is only sensitive to changes in the magnetic field. So if the magnetic field's constant, you actually detect nothing. But brain activity obviously is sort of an ongoing dynamic process, so you've always got fluctuations going on there. So that's the basic sort of concept, and uh, the squids, the squid part is the same in all of the sensor types that I'm about to talk about. And what's different is basically the detector coil that generates the input for those squids. And so for that, there's broadly speaking three sensor types. In practice, only there's, there's two because the first two, the magnetometer and the axial gradiometer, are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, so most simply, the magnetometer is what I showed you in the last slide, right? So you've got a simple coil, and magnetic fields will induce a current in that coil. Take that to the squid. The problem with that is that the magnetic fields that are inducing that are the brain's magnetic fields plus the environmental magnetic fields. So you get everything in there and no way to differentiate. So where the axial gradiometer comes in is as a clever way of filtering out or subtracting, essentially, the background magnetic fields. So the part close to the brain is the same, loop of wire conductor. The difference is you've got a second loop that's a little farther away, and it's far enough from the brain that the magnetic field from the brain will have dropped off. So you're not going to get brain signal in the second loop. But you will still get the environmental noise, because the environmental noise is much more sort of broadly present. right? So one loop picks up only brain activity. Both loops pick up ambient activity. And critically, the second loop is wound in the opposite direction from the first loop. And what that means is when the current, or sorry, the magnetic field hits one loop, it's going to generate a current in one direction. And when it hits the other, it's going to induce current in the other direction because the winding is different. And so, which you can see with the gold arrows pointing in the two different directions there. And so what that means is you're inducing equal and opposite currents um, from the, by the ambient noise and those will cancel each other out. So the net current coming out is really just what's coming out from the brain, ideally. In practice, those magnetic fields may change even you know, the ambient ones even between those two sensors. So it's not going to be, give you perfect cancellation, but it's going to give you highly effective cancellation relative to the simple magnetometer. The idea of the planar gradiometer is similar in the sense that you've got two coils, and you see the sort of figure eight winding, which means that the the winding of the two circles is opposite directions. So again, any ambient external magnetic field is going to impinge on both of those coils roughly equally, induce opposite going current directions in both, and those will cancel out. The difference is that both the loops are close to the head, as opposed to one being farther away, which means that it's sensitive to differences in brain activity 
for brain magnetic flux between the positions where those two coils are located. And so if you actually have equal mag brain magnetic field at both parts of that coil, it'll cancel out because, again, you've got that winding. But if you have differential magnetic field of two, as happens as you sort of move across the scalp, you'll pick that up as a difference and, and you'll get some, some brain signal for that. And so what this means is that the axial gradiometers and the planar gradiometers are sensitive to different orientations of magnetic fields. And again, remember that the orientation of the magnetic field coming out of the head is dependent on how the generating source in the brain is oriented. Some are going to be invisible because the magnetic field is entirely inside the head. But for the ones that come out, if we start with the top left figure here. So the green arrow in the center of the circles is the electrical dipole. So we imagine that we have this dipole and the current's flowing out towards, towards you as the viewer. And then the magnetic fields are the dashed lines surrounding that. Again, right-hand rule. I need to use my right hand. So they're coming out of the head on the right side of the screen and back down on the, the left side of the screen. And the black ones are staying entirely inside the head. The colored ones are outside the head with red, meaning the ones that are coming out, and the blue are the, the fields going back into the head. And so there's sort of a zero point in the center. So in terms of like physics and math and how we quantify these magnetic fields, we can say that they have a radial component, which is coming the, the strength of the magnetic field coming out of the head, and a parallel component, which is the strength of the magnetic field um, tangential to that point on the head. And so depending on where our sensor is, we've got, you know, over on both the right and the left, we've got a strong radial component, but not much in the way of a parallel component. Whereas directly over that dipole, we've got a strong parallel component because the magnetic field is basically sort of going laterally, but a very weak radial component. So what that means is that um, the axial radiometers are mostly sensitive to that radial component. So you're going to pick up a signal from that axial radiometer over on the right and over on the left, but not directly over the dipole where that source is. And um, it'll be sort of going in one direction, coming out in another direction if it's going in. Right? Whereas the planar gradiometers are sensitive to the parallel component. And so the planar gradiometer is going to show the biggest response when it's directly over the dipole. And that's because at that point you've got, you know, if you think of the, the loop sitting over that area sort of centered on B, one of those loops is going to pick up the more sort of blue side of this and one's going to pick up the more red side of that. So you have that big difference locally between the two based on brain current that's going to drive the signal in the planar gradiometer. And so that's shown more schematically on the right here where you've got, uh, if you've got just the radial component at point A over on the left, which is going straight down, you get a big negative uh, deflection in the MEG. Over at C, you've got a weaker but coming out of the head magnetic field, so you get a positive effect. And at B, where you've just got the parallel component, you're going to see nothing with your axial radiometer, but you're going to see a big signal with your planar. Um, and then for planar, I've plotted these three other uh, effects relative to looking down at the top of the head rather than cross-sectional view here so that you can see hopefully so again green arrow is the dipole do this yeah. uh, and at E you're going to get a big signal because the way that uh, planar gradiometer is oriented one side's over the sort of input into the head side of the uh, radial component ones on the um, output side uh, F on the other hand is sort of lying right along one of these contour lines. So it's basically got the same strength of mag magnetic field at both loops. So there's going to be, there's no difference. So there's nothing that uh, that's going to show you a signal from. Uh, and then at D, you're both over parts of the field coming out of the head, but one's stronger and one's weaker. And so you can get a, a weaker um, signal at D there. The other thing that you have to notice about this is, uh, especially if you look at E, compared to F, say, uh, the orientation of the planar gradiometer relative to the head matters a lot, right? So at E, if we had those, that figure eight, so that it looked like an eight rather than an infinity, we would actually get no signal 
because then it would be parallel with the, the contour lines and there would be no difference. And so in the Electa system, at each one of these sensor locations, so there's 106 sensor locations inside the helmet, which are shown by these squares, each one has one axial gradiometer, because you just need one to measure that radial component, but two planar gradiometers that are oriented perpendicular to each other. So that at that point, you're sensitive to um, these changes in the, the parallel component, regardless of direction. So if, you know, if one's directly aligned with a difference, that's great. Even if neither one is exactly aligned, you're going to get some weak difference in both planar gradiometers. And so the, the systems have algorithms built into the, the sort of processing pipeline that know which sensor a signal is coming from and how it's oriented relative to the head. And uh, when you look at the sensor data, you actually get three outputs for each channel of your system, which is kind of overwhelming compared to EEG. So you have 306 individual sort of waveforms to, to deal with. But uh, in practice, you can combine the ones from the two planar gradiometers, and it just gives you a measure of the, the overall amount of magnetic flux at, at each location. And when you're doing source localization, it can account for the orientations of those two different planar gradiometers to get a better sense of how it can triangulate the signal. We'll come to that a bit later. But this just shows you the continuous raw data, which looks a lot like continuous EEG data. Uh, one thing that I did mention before here, this one here, those are cardiac artifacts, those big spikes there. So again, that's something you see more frequently in MEG than you do with EEG. And this is what you see when you look at average DPOX. This was like an evoked auditory response. And so what's interesting is if you look at the scalp maps from these two sensor types, if you look first at the axial one, first of all, you're seeing red and blue. Whereas with the planar, you're just seeing red. So there's no negative with the planar gradiometers because they're just telling you, is there a difference between those two loops? Um, so it's more just sort of magnitude of signal rather than plus negative. Uh, whereas the axial gradiometers are telling you whether that flux is coming out of the head or going back into the head. So again, out is red, in is blue. And if you look in a fine-grained way, you can see there's essentially two inversions here. So you've got a on the left side of the head, a red spot, and sort of more centrally, a blue spot more anteriorly. It's reversed there. If you think about this, so this is an early auditory response. What part of the brain is generating that early auditory response? It's meant to be an easy question. Primary visual cortex? Primary auditory cortex. Where is primary auditory cortex? Temporal lobe, superior temporal lobe, right? So if you imagine you've got sources in the two temporal lobes, this kind of alignment makes sense. So you can basically sort of infer where the dipole is and its orientation just from looking at that, right? Because uh, if, if the magnetic field, take my right hand, it's coming out at the red, blue, in at the blue, so the dipole must be oriented sort of out and to be the sort of back outside of the head. And then this one in the, the right hemisphere is oriented the same out to the back, which is why the sort of pattern left and right it looks different. Whereas with the planar gradiometers, you see that the biggest differences are sort of over the white areas in the axial, because again, this the axial is the sort of in and out. The planar is the flat part between the in and the out. So it makes sense that the biggest flux is going to be in between where you see the hot spots there. So, so as I say, the Electa system has both types of sensors. Other ones, at least the older CTF systems, I think had only magnetometers. And there were some systems that were made that had only planar gradiometers. So each one is, is sufficient on its own to give you information. And as you can see, there's you know, it's somewhat redundant information. But by having both, you get richer information and better ability to accurately uh, source localize when it comes to that. Uh, so. I mentioned the head movement, and this is a way of tracking the head movement, is basically you attach, so you attach these coils to the head, uh, sort of one over each temple, one over the forehead, something like that. Uh, basically, you just need three points at diverse locations on the head, which essentially defines a plane and allows the system to track. And these are generating um, alternating currents, so electrical signals, 
at a very high frequency. So they're far higher than the frequency range of human EEG or, or MEG signals. So they're not going to interfere, but there's something that gets picked up by the MEG system. And because they're an integrated part of the system, it knows what to do with that information. It doesn't contribute noise to the data, but it allows you to track where each of those is uh, inside the scanner. And so you have a record uh, of how much the person moved and how their head moved. And so this is useful both for sort of saying, okay, the data is poor quality because the head movement was just massive, um, but also if the head movement is relatively minor, you can correct for it. And the, the system has software that basically will uh, sort of try and adjust the data according to how the head moved from, from moment to moment, uh, which is similar to, to fMRI as well when we get there. The other thing that's done uh, to facilitate this and facilitate source localization later is digitizing the shape of the head. And so what you're seeing here, the person is holding a stylus, just a little pen-like pointer, and they're tapping it to different locations on the head and pressing a button which sends a signal. And this is basically measuring the position of the stylus in, in sort of a three-dimensional space, so it knows each location. And so first you tap each of those head position locators so you know where they are uh, on the head uh, and sort of their relative distance from each other. But then you'll also tap a whole bunch of like hundreds of points on the head uh, which are shown by all these purple spots uh, in this upper right picture here. And what that does is basically provide a 3D digitization of the shape of the head. And so the MEG sensors are just sort of in this helmet, right? So they don't really know anything about the size and shape of the individual's head. But uh, when we merge the head position indicator data, which tells you where those critical points of the head were, with all this other digitized information, basically you can come up with a 3D rendering of the outside of the head and know where that head was from moment to moment and that sort of thing. And that becomes very useful later because if you want to do source localization, you want to sort of map the, the head shape to like an MRI or a structural representation of the brain, um, including maybe a structural MRI from that individual or a generic one. And so having the shape of the head facilitates how do you sort of align all the data from the MEG to closely match the shape of the head. This really just uh, makes a point that I kind of made already about the differential between EEG and MEG. Right again, right-hand rule, they have uh, uh, outputs that are basically perpendicular to each other. You can see that over on the left here with what we call a tangential dipole. So the dipole is oriented uh, such that the positive end is pointing out to the left side of the head. So with EEG, you're going to get strong positive potential on the, on the left side of the head, negative potential on the right side of the head. MEG, it's going to be magnetic field coming out of the head at the back, into the head uh, at the front. The radial dipole, here we have something where it's close to the top of the head and the positive pole is pointing out. So with EEG, you're just going to get positivity over the whole top of the head and probably every electrode you have because you probably don't have a lot of electrodes on the lower part of the head that would even pick up the negative side of that dipole. But again, here, you know, it always helps to imagine your, your right hand superimposed over this. You've got magnetic flux that's entirely contained within the head. Um, it's not going to come out of the head. If it is weakly, it's going to be sort of far at the front and the back, but it'll probably have dropped off enough by then. You're, you're not really going to detect it. And so there are things that you can see an EEG effect for that you won't see an MEG effect just because of how the, the dipole is generated. The reverse is generally not true because, again, EEG volume conducts in every direction. So I can't imagine a situation where you wouldn't see an EEG effect at all on the scalp, but you would be able to detect the MEG. So it's more that MEG is basically blind to certain kinds of orientations. Now, in practice, you know, this is a very theoretical and schematic kind of representation and concern because, in practice, we don't have point sources in our brain. We have generally fairly extended areas of activation in order to generate something that we can measure at the scalp because they need to summate across lots of neurons uh, to be able to do that. And so if you think about the fact that the cortex is folded, any given active area might include some stuff on a, on a gyrus, some stuff down in the sulcus. And so there might be parts of that that aren't generating a me measurable magnetic field outside the head but other parts of that extended area of activation that are. So how, how big of a problem this is is not terribly well understood.